I guess we can get started. So, hi everyone, my name is Roman Kodelaka, and uh, currently I'm working as a development manager at Mirantis. Uh, we're a really small team of engineers who work on uh, a stack project called NOAA. Um, just one quick note here, I posted the link to slides to Twitter with my own PL hashtag, and uh, if you don't see slides or snippets, snippets from the back rows, uh, just open the link. See the slides. Okay, so let's start with the goals. And the first and the most important goal here is to make GDP a known unknown for you. And what I mean by that is you obviously can teach people how to use it. such a complex thing in 40 minutes, and uh, you don't need to be a GDP expert to make it useful for you. So I guess the most important thing is that by the end of this talk, you will know there is such an option in the future. So when you face a problem, you don't get stuck. You know where, what to look up, what to read about, and uh, you know how to solve your problem. And uh, the side goal is to highlight the common gotchas, because the process itself is not that difficult, but there are a few known gotchas, and uh, they might stand in the way. And uh, the motivational part. So why the bug in the first place? Uh, the specifics of my job at Mirantis is that we contribute to OpenStack projects together with other companies like Red Hat, Intel, Canonical, Rackspace. So we don't start a new project every other month or week or so. Uh, projects have been worked upon for years now, and it's not like you every day work on a new feature. Uh, well, features like water obviously, but for our customers and for people using OpenStack, it is also crucial so that these things actually work and work correctly and uh, highly available, resilient to failures and so on. So, who knows what OpenStack is? Okay, so it's quite a few people. For those who don't know, it's like a free alternative to AWS. You can install on your servers and so on and so on. So, the value in variety sets is that we integrate all the components into our own distribution of OpenStack. We provide the reference architecture how to deploy and configure it, and we run a number a number of different tests against it, like functional, performance, scale test. And we also have numerous customer deployments, and uh, we provide support for them so they can come and uh, file tickets, and we will work on their problems and see whether it's a bug in OpenStack or so. And when you have those number of deployments, when you do those number of tests, things will break pretty much often, and uh, when they break, you should be able to debug them to understand the root cause and uh, fix them and uh, understand how to prevent them in the future. So we debug a lot. A few caveats first. Uh, this talk is a bit opinionated and it uh, kind of assumes that you use Linux in production. I'm not sure is anyone else using some, something else than Linux. Okay, that's good. So anyway, Mega 6 and Windows should work, but you sh I haven't read it. Because on Mega 6, GDB is not like a preferable choice. There is LTB debugger, and uh, like for Windows builds, this should work, but I'm not sure whether debugging symbols are shipped with the build on the available on the Python.org, so you may need to build it yourself. And uh, this technique works for obviously C Python because debugging scripts are interpreter specific. And uh, C Python 2.6 works, but the scripts are kind of outdated, so the newer version we have, the better. That's the rule of thumb here. And uh, yeah, as I said, it won't work for PyPy or Jaita. I'm not sure if anyone is using them. Okay. So, what's wrong with PDB? Uh, if you are using printf debugging right now, you should definitely stop and look at PDB page. And uh, PDB is awesome, it's nice and easy to use debugger, but it has a few limitations. And uh, I think the first one that affects my workflow the most is that it can't attach the running process. So it is a common it's a problem that your processes get stuck somewhere. And uh, it would be very nice if you could just attach to them with the PDB, but you can't. So basically you need to instrument your process in advance, put import PDB, PDB dot set trace, or just run them under PDB from the start. But the problem is that you don't know in advance whether the problem will be reproduced. Another problem is that uh, 
is that often, right, that it's not only your Python code, it's often you use some native libraries, even if you don't know about it, because your dependency may use that. And uh, if it's some complex issue, you, you need to step into that code, you can't do it with DDB. And there are cases, maybe they happen not so often for you, but when you use native code, they still happen. When the interpreter itself crashes, and obviously, if there is no interpreter, just can't use PDB. So, yeah, let's look up again at these typical problems. I think the most common, which happens for us, is hanging processes. So, it looks like in top, well, if the application stops responding, and in top, you can see that it's, it's an S or sleeping state, uh, thus, it is waiting for a system call to finish. Uh, and uh, you can understand that just by attaching to the process with S trace, which is system call tracing. And, uh, but all you will see is like, you will see the name of the system call, and you can understand whether it's a read that does not finish, or whether it's a Qdex call, which acquires a log. But it does not tell you, right? It does not tell you where exactly in your application it happens. It may be everywhere. So it would, it would be very nice if you, we could map this system call to a particular line in your code. <clears throat> and this is especially important if you use cooperative concurrency like async IO, G event, eventlet, when uh, there is no operating system that will switch the context of control to something other, thread or whatever. But you have to pass this uh, context explicitly, manually. And if you don't, the whole process gets stuck, and uh, your request will not be processed, for example. Another problem is when you need to go to native code. Just to give you an example, which uh, I had to work with last week, which is a very simple but still annoying problem. So we have like 14,000 unit tests, and when I run this test in my machine, one of you created a temporary directory in my git checkout, and it, it was very annoying because how do you identify which one? Was, the, was that? And one way would be to set a breakpoint in a, like very low-level function like os main tiers, but PDB can't do that. And uh, in general case, this directory could even be created from some native code, from some native library, and PDB like, would not even have a chance to uh, trace that. And as I told, uh, we fixed a couple of observer regressions. Although you may think that they don't happen often, but still, with things like ModWizG, I'm not sure if anyone is using ModWizG for hosting these applications, but uh, there is a link to a problem when uh, you do a reload, not not restart of Apache, and uh, it may break, may like uh, sick, completely sick fault the Apache process. Or with things like CFFI, when you do calls to native libraries, uh, there was an issue with uh, it was compiled with GCC. 5, 2, whatever, and uh, there was a problem with the compatibility between CF5 and GCC. So, GDB to the rest. What is GDB? GDB is a general purpose debugger, which is mostly used by C and C++ programmers, but it, it actually supports more languages, uh, specifically Pascal or Objective-C or just the, I think just the latest version actually supports Rust. Uh, and the, the killer feature of GDB is that it can attach to a running process without streaming it in advance or starting in some specific way under debugging. So you can debug these hanging processes. Another feature is that instead of attaching like and completely stopping the process, you can take a core dump, which is a, like a complete copy of the process memory at a specific moment of time, and you can analyze it later. And the uh, uh, specific case of this is post-mortem debugging when the interpreter crashed and the kernel took a uh, core temp for you and saved it somewhere so that you can attach, uh, use this core temp to try to understand why that happened, why that, why that sec fault happened, for example. And it also helps switching between threads. And uh, even if it's not very common to use threads in Python, some people still do, so it may be important for you. Uh, okay, so let's see how this how this works internally. Uh, we don't have much time to spend on this, but still, if you are interested in how S trace works, how debuggers work, uh, P trace is your guy. P trace is a very specific system call in POSIX 
operating systems that allow one process, a tracer, to control execution of another process, a tracer. So basically you can ask another process to read locally. We all know that processes have their own independent memory space, right? And one process can't read another process memory. They're like completely separated for a reason. And, uh, but some very specific pro programs like debuggers actually need to do that to introspect state of other processes. That's why there is such mechanism uh, in the operating system that allows you to attach to another process, to read its memory, to um, like suspend its execution, to resume its execution for one CPU instruction, and so on. And uh, how is debugging of interpreted languages different? Uh, so when you debug our you know, C++ plus application, right, it is compiled into native binary. It's like literally CPU instructions to be executed. So when you attach to it, GDB will show you like very specific instruction which is currently being executed. But when you attach to a Python process, uh, you will effectively debug the interpreter process because it's the interpreter which Compile, is compiled to the native code, and uh, your code is compiled to another code which is called bytecode, which is just a pro very similar thing, but not for real CPU, but for Python virtual machine, just for efficiency reasons, so that the interpreter does not need to parse uh, your code every other time, it just compiles it once into bytecode definition, and then just goes over each instruction as a real CPU would do. So, uh, just to give you an example, this is how the trace back looks at the interpreter level when I attach to a Python process. So you will see functions like people wait from glibc, from standard implementation of C library, or by people pull from CPython implement, from the implementation of CPython, and so on. So this does not really tell you, right? This does not really tell you where this people happens in your application code. That's why we need a way to somehow map them to application code. And what you really want to see is, you want to see something like that, right? You want to see your Python code, the exact lines, so that this trace back you can analyze, you can understand what happened with your application and what went wrong. And uh, there is this very specific function in CPython, which is called pyEvalEvalFrameX. And uh, you might notice that it was mentioned a couple of times in the traceback of CPython previously. And uh, it turns out that the, that's the very meat of CPython. That's the place where uh, evaluation of bytecode happens. So it's just a, like a big loop which goes over the, each bytecode instruction of your compiled function. And it just gives a giant switch statement which, which knows how to execute each bytecode instruction in Python. And that's it. Uh, so basically, PyEvalFrameX is called for uh, call to this function in the interpreter is done for every call in your application code you do in Python. So knowing that, we can then analyze these frames in the interpreter process and uh, introspect data, introspect the arguments of this function or local variables of this function to understand. We, well, using that, we can map. The, these calls to the calls in your application. And um, there is a blog post, there is a link, you can take a look at it later. There is a blog post on CPython internals, so you can look it up later. And uh, so, how is GDB and Python related? Uh, it turns out that GDB itself can be built with Python support enabled, and what it essentially means is that uh, GDB has its own, uh, has its own comments and uh, has its own language for writing like basic scripts to do things. But it's not really useful. Python is much more convenient language to do that. So basically, starting from, I think, version 7, GDP developers allowed to uh, write this debugger script in Python and basically expose the powers of GDB via Python API. And there is like a module available for your GDB and uh, you can use it to analyze function frames, Print state of register, registers, local variables, get information on their types, and so on and so on. And uh, the very same mechanism was actually chosen by CPython developers who wanted to allow debugging of CPython code. So 
there is a link to the scripts. Uh, they are shipped together with CPython and they are developed within a CPython tree. So, let's get started. For requisites, what do you need? Obviously, you'll need GDB, right? Uh, just take the package manager you use on your distro, install it, and uh, the only thing you need to check is that GDB is actually be built with Python support. Then the way to do that is just like, um, start GDB and ask it to execute a basic Python statement, like print OK, whatever. And if it prints OK, then your GDB version is correct and built with Python support. Another important thing is debugging symbols. Uh, who here has ever programmed in C or C++? Oh, so it's quite a lot. Okay, you guys know what that, that is. So basically, it's a information on the. So it's the way to map the compiled code, like the CPU instructions, right, back to the source code you have. So you had previously before compilation process with the saving of all the information on types of variables and so on. Uh, and actually, you don't need to do like two builds of application, so you don't need to do like a debug build and production build to be able to debug production processes. You just need to pass this flag to Clang or GCC, whatever you use, minus G, to, to let it know that you want to, when, when, the, so that when it compiles your code, it also saves this information somewhere in the binary file. So there is a special section in the uh, binary files where this is information is stored. But the only catch here is that they tend to consume a lot of disk space. So it may be like 10 times the size of your original binary. So people don't want to have this overhead if you don't ever need to debug it, right? So you, there is a util called strip, which can strip it from the binary files. And that's what distros do. They strip this information. They, they build all the code with, with uh, debug information enabled. Then they strip it and ship it separately. But they ship it separately, but you can still install it. So in Ubuntu and uh, Debian, this package is called like, something like Python-debug or Python-3-debug. Uh, in Fedora and the uh, railway distros, it's Python-debug info, but there, is, there isn't one patch here that center, at least CentOS and rel distros, uh, they don't have these packages in their like, main repo. They put it into a separate repo. There's a link to it, uh, but basically, you can just Google for uh, debugging information for all packages, but they all put it here, or put it in that, that repo. And some distros, I think Arch Linux, they basically build code without PinSG and do not ship uh, debugging symbols at all, so you might need to rebuild the package yourself with the correct build packs. And uh, the scripts that I talked about, there is a link to the CPython, so they are developed within CPython tree. Uh, and basically, when Python is, C Python is packaged by distros, they take, they take this file and ship it together with the Python debug package. And uh, you may not even know that they exist because GDP will load the, this script automatically when the Python binary is debugged. So there is notion of afterload, and it will use the binary name, and uh, it will look for in the known path for this name, and. Uh, thing called your binary dash debug.py and if, if there's such file then it will be loaded automatically when you attach the Python process. So how how we get started? So the basic thing is like a BDB when you started the process in specific way, start it on the debugger from right away. Uh, you just pass the Python binary name to GDB and then uh, use the command run, which is to run the, run the it, it is called inferior process, the one that you are debugging in, in terms of GDB. You can pass the, your command line arguments as you would do in command line. But that's easy, but we are mostly interested in other cases, right? We are mostly interested to, in, in attaching to the running processes, and that's easy as well. You just use the GDB infer path to inferior dash P and then process AD of your thing you want to debug. Or you can even omit the inferior path, but we'll see why it is not advice to do that later. One note here, when you attach to a running process, all the threads of this application will stop, will be suspended. 
and uh, like if you do it in production, right? If, if it's some system in the let's say you have ten threads concurrently processing user requests, and only two of them are stuck somewhere in the system called Futex or whatever, and uh, eight are still operational. You don't want to do that, right? Yes, if it's your production, you want to like proceed further. So uh, we will see how how to overcome that. There is a better alternative. You can. Uh, Take a core down. You, you can basically take current state of process memory and save it for analysis later. And let's say you can restart the process, right? You can restart it, and maybe it will work, maybe it will not. But at least, there, there, at least there is a chance it will work because otherwise you just stop it for for the period of debugging. So yeah, taking the core down is easy. There is a util sheet with GDB. It's called GCore. You just pass it the process ID, and it saves uh, it in a file by default called core dot process ID. And you can open this file later, just GDB, pass to inferior, pro, inferior binary, and uh, pass to core file. So when we attach to or open the core file, what, we can, what can we do, right? Uh, there is a, a script, the script sheet with cpython provide a few commands. They all start with py uh, dash something. So there is, and they, they're basically named after the commands which you have in PDB. So there's a command bt or by bt which will print you the traceback you are used to. So for example, this was this one was taken on the process that was stuck right into log, and uh, that was the only like that's how I understood that because from observer perspective it was not clear why the process is stuck. But seeing a traceback, uh, it could provide information on the exact lines where this call happened and when it happened. So pretty much like the, or you can list the your know, Python code around this line. So we, we see that line 872 is currently being executed and stuck there. We can see context around it. We can go frame one frame up, one frame frame down, like, like you're used to with up or down. So by up, by down, we'll do that. We can print uh, values of local variables. Uh, I omitted the output of self because it took all the slides. But yeah, you get the idea. You can print power loss will print all, all the values of local variables. You can use pyprint and pass the variable name to print the specific variable. But the only case here is that may, you may be used in PDB or any similar debugger. You may be used to like you know, put not not variables names, right? You, you used to put to like any Python expression. And uh, well, variable is a special case of expression, but in general case of expression won't work here because that would require to actually execute Python code. And at this level, we don't execute anything, we just introspect, just like introspect the state in read-only mode. We do not modify the state of the Python process in any way. So it's kind of limited. A more interesting example would be Back to, to do my problem with uh, 14,000 test cases and uh, one of you creating a temporary director. So how we can debug that? Uh, we know that like uh, wherever it was created from an A to write library or a Python code, we know that the only thing that could do that is operating system because only it can uh, create files, read files, whatever. So, and the, the interface to the operating system for creating directories is a system call, called make do. And uh, there is a wrapper to make the system call in standard C library, GDBC. I think you use that. And uh, you can actually set a breakpoint. Using GDB, you can set a breakpoint in that wrapper. And it's actually not with C code. Well, it's technical, it's the sampler code. Uh, and the, it's down here. If you take a look at the GLBC sources, there is a couple of macros that uh, assemble that uh, do this in, in assembly. So yeah, it's not even a C function as it is, but still you can, you can set a breakpoint there. And uh, if I have like forty thousand unit tests, right? I don't want to break on any main directory because. There might be like well, lead directories, and I know that my directory that was created had this name, had instances in it, in its path. So you can set like in GDB, 
like in any other decent debugger, you, you can make your breakpoints conditional. So they can so they you only hit it, hit them when the condition yields true. And uh, here I use the function called regex, which is actually implemented in Python too. Uh, not not too. <laughs> Got it. Uh, implemented in Python and shipped together with GDB, and it allows you to uh, match a specific string against a pattern, right? And uh, you also like in PDB. Uh, sorry. Like in PDB, you can there is a comment called comments, and uh, you can attach to a breakpoint a few comments to be executed automatically. So let's say I just want to run the test suite and uh, for each breakpoint I want to print a uh, Python backtrace. And yeah, so it's pretty similar to PDB if you, if you ever used that. If you didn't, then condition, conditional breakpoints and things like comments are uh, very useful. So yeah, there is a cache here. So as I told this, uh, this particular wrapper on system called was implemented in assembly and the uh, information on its first argument, you can look it up in the man page, right? It's called pass, but it wasn't stored, so I couldn't use uh, a name local variable here and uh, I had to be a bit creative and uh, look up the calling convention used on 44-bit systems, 44-bit Linuxes, 60, 60, I'm sorry. Uh, uh, so yeah, the thing is that if you look it up, you will see that the first argument when C functions are compiled, C++ functions are compiled, it is passed via RDI register. So you can use the value of that register, cast it to char star, which is treated as a string rate, uh, as a pointer to a string, a string starts. You can, you can use that, so yeah. And uh, Crazy, you can do crazy things. You basically from in GDP you can call any function in your C Python process. So this actually fails for me. The last line sec false my process when I tried it, but it is supposed to be the, the correct way to use it. I'm not sure why it failed, but it's essentially what things like by the D do when they attach the process. So just to give you an idea, be very careful, careful with this because any any action can go can lead to sec fault and your process will stop. And then obviously you can only do that live, right? When you attach the running process, you can do it on the on a portal. But yeah, basically you can execute any Python code within the context of this process. It may be very useful. Okay, so gorgeous. It looked very simple, and uh, basically all you needed to do, right, is to install the debugging symbols and uh, just use GDB to attach to your process. And it should work like a charm, but there are a few catches. When I first tried it on the process, it's from, run from virtual environments. I noticed that debugging symbols can't be loaded. And the reason for that is GDB looks for them in the wrong place. So if you just use common GDB-P, my process ID, right? It will have to understand which inferior, which is the binary you are trying to debug. In the way it does that, there is this special file system uh, slash prop, right? And uh, if you ever looked at it in context, uh, uh, there is a, for each process running in your system, there is a directory with the name of the process ID, in which information on the running processes is stored. And it, it is that's the way it is exposed in Linux to you. The, the way like top or H top or whatever provides information on the running processes. And GB actually looks there and it uses the process ID you pass and there is a file called, well it's a symlink exe and the GDB uses that symbolic to understand which binary you're trying to debug, but if you use virtual env, right, you will not be using the Python from user being Python or whatever, you'll be using Python from your virtual environment. And uh, for, the, for that Python, it does not know how to load debugging symbol because it looks for predefined directories like user link debug and uh, uh, 
uh, a bust the binary to, to load them, and it won't find them. So what you can do at this point, if you know that this particular virtual environment was created from a reasonably specific Python binary, right? So when you create a virtual environment, basically the C Python and its internals are copied to the virtual environment here, copy screen. If you know that this virtual environment was created from this binary, you can just pass the binary name to GDB and it will not try to understand the, uh, what binary was used, but it will just load whatever you asked. And it will work. And alter the best alternative on modern distros, at least Debian we want to do that, right now, uh, when they compile CPython, they put this value of build ID into the binary. There is a special section in the binary file called no new build ID, and uh, like it's basically a unique identifier, right? And it's, this identifier is used to load debugging symbols from another predefined path, like user lib debug build ID, and like, there's a <coughs> ID there. So if you try, you, you won't see this problem on modern distros like you want to. And the very similar things happens to uh, debugging scripts. So even if debugging symbols will upload it correctly, you may see that the comments we saw, like PyBT or PyList or whatever, will be unavailable, will be undefined. And the reason for that is GDB performs auto-loading of debugging scripts, but for, for it to work, you know, your script should be named after like pass-gdb.py. Debian and Ubuntu do that, right? And uh, they put it into a predefined autoload directory and they use a pass with, to, your, to your binary, Python binary, and add the suffix dash uh, gdb that path. It will be loaded automatically, but in the case of virtual environments, path again will be incorrect. But that's not a big problem. You can always load the scripts manually, you just need to know that there is a source command in GDB and you can pass it the, uh, just pass the bus to the bugging scripts. They ship either with your CPython build by distro like you want to a Debian or you can just uh, clone the CPython repo, right? And you can use the one the version from there. And yeah, it actually can be useful to, to use the latest script because they almost always have backwards compatibility and the, new, the newer scripts the better. So you can just use the scripts shipped with the default branch of CPython. Another problem. So when you attach to a process, you may see an error that betrays attach is not permitted. And the reason for that, there is this file, the proc file system again, that controls permissions on whether you can attach to another process or not. And I think in some countries like, I think it's France, things like this trace, I consider it to be like hacking tools because they can interfere with other processes, they can read their memory, trace their system calls, and uh, anyway. So, the common practice in some distros is to uh, provide the level of security or whatever so that you can, by default, can attach the running process. Uh, there are multiple choices here. So, Debian is used is using zero, which means that you can attach to any process with the same user ID, which is uh, kind of reasonable, I think. So you can trace any processes that are run from your user ID, right? Uh, you want to use one, which means that only descendants, only ch children processes can be traced, which for you means that only the processes that you can attach to running process, you can only start the process using GDB which is not very cool. The, but that's for, like, for general users. Admin still can do that. Uh, and even more severe levels, so that only can admin can attach to any process, and, uh, or alternatively, you can trace children processes that you start from the start, but the thing is that ch the child process should do a ptrace call with special constant ptrace trace v, which is not not really cool. And there is like a grace level that just forbids any attachment at all. Uh, so yeah, there, there is also this binary called python dash debug. I'm not sure if you've seen it or not. So when I first uh, 
read about debugging of C Python with GDB. I, I was confused whether I should use Python dash debug or whether I should use Python binary, right? And uh, the thing is that for Python dash debug, the describe technique will work, but it, it's essentially a separate build of C Python, which was configured with option dash dash with dash by debug, and it enables it, it basically it enables a debugging macro. Uh, in, in C Python code and enables many many runtime checks and uh, this build is usually much slower right on very simple operation of summing of numbers it's like almost two and a half times slower and uh, and while it, it is useful for C Python developers when they debug C Python right it's not useful for you if you just if you're not interested in debugging C Python interpreter yourself but you're interested in debugging your applications and uh, obviously you won't run the applications with Python debug, at least from the start. And e even if you can reproduce the problem and it's like not debugging on production, uh, at least we experienced some problems with uh, starting of our processes which use eventlet with Python debug, it just failed. But the good news is that you don't actually need Python debug to like debug the Python processes. It is useful to do that if you can like, restart the process, but if you can't, and if you have like a core dump done not from Python debug binary but from Python binary original one, yeah, it's like it's totally different binary, it's what was built with different legs. Um, then you don't need it, you just need debugging symbols for the original Python build. Okay, so another another problem. Uh, at least on modern distros, I haven't seen that, but on distros like Bound to 1204, there was a problem that C Python was built with debugging symbols enabled, but the level of debugging was one instead of two, which is default. And the, the problem, the, the difference between these two levels, one and two, is that at level one, only information on function names is stored, but the information on the types of function arguments is not, or like local variables. And uh, as we saw, this very specific by eval frame x function. We actually need the information on uh, the type of its first argument uh, because its first argument is the is the reference to the function object in the Python code. So it kind of worked. It may or may not work, but yeah, with G1 it won't work at all. With G0, no debugging information is enabled at all, and the uh, default is two, which is synonym for minus G. Uh, and there is also level 3, but it's not needed for debugging of C Python. Okay, so there is another problem which you may see when like, you attach to a process, you execute pi minus bt, and you see something like frame information optimized out. And you see part of traceback, there is like a two, two frames here, right? We see function g and f both correctly, but we can't see the color of F for some reason. And the reason for that is when aggressive optimizations like O3 is used for building of C Python, even though information, debugging some information was generated, the, the code may, may be compiled in a way so that uh, the variables were optimized out. If Clang or GCC thought that it, it won't need it, right? It can generate any code it wants as long as, as, long as it behaves like the way you wrote it. So, yeah, aggressive optimizations can do pretty much what they want. So, information on local variables may, may be lost. And if it's lost, you will see something like something like that. And unfortunately, at this point, there is not much you can do. Uh, there is a link later in the, refer in the references section on the blog post of, of a guy who tells a bit how to debug such cases. But overall, yeah, it's, it's, not, really, it's not really good. And uh, yeah, about PyPy, Jiten, or whatever. So the describe technique is like specifically for C Python because it relies on C Python tutorials like PyWall Evolve Framings. Other interpreters may not have those functions. So this extension should be C Python specifically for debugging C Python and uh, for debugging of PyPy, Jiten, Python, Python, or whatever. You may need to use like, their own tools. For PyPy, there is actually there is a similar thing. There are similar scripts. Well, at least there is an issue on the budget. 
where a guy proposed a similar script integration with GDB, but it was like two years ago, two or three years ago, and uh, I think it still wasn't merged, and uh, it's not nearly as as good as the one shipped with CPython. And uh, for Jaita, you can actually use the standard JVM tools for debugging, and uh, it won't be so. The tra the tra for example, the tracebacks you see, you will see, it won't be as as good, as close to Python tracebacks you are used to. But still, you can use the native debugging tools for that platform to debug. Okay, so here are the links. Uh, the first link points to the blog by Brandon Gregg. I'm not sure if you heard about this guy, but he's pretty awesome. He is a performance engineer at Netflix, and uh, he blogs a lot on uh, various tracers for Linux. And uh, he also has a very great, great article on using of JDB, like a tutorial on how to debug a particular problem. It, it was in some, not, not well, I'm not, yeah, I don't remember whether it was in Python code or not, but it is still worth taking a look if you want to understand how, how to use GDB. Uh, there is also a blog post on this very topic. By, by that, that's the one uh, the, in, in, you, in which we can find information on how to debug optimized style frames. It is also worth mentioning then that things like PyDFD, which is used in the Eclipse and uh, in PyCharm, this debugger can actually attach to a processes as well. It can go to native code, but it can attach to processes. And it is, if you take a look at the sources, it, on Linux, it basically uses that technique for running off arbitrary Python code. And it uses GDB to attach to a process, then runs code that starts, that connects to your debugger started in PyCharm, for example, right? And uh, then detaches from a process. So it, use, it uses GDB to instrument the process and attach to it live. And uh, it is also worth mentioning that there was a debugger by which, oh, there is one, but I think it, it hasn't been updated for three years now. It was a research project of Google intern uh, who basically used the very same technique for attaching to a live to a Python process <coughs> and then evaluated a arbitrary Python code. But it wasn't updated for a while and uh, I, I think it's only for Python 2. Still, you, you may want to take a look at that one. So, the conclusion is, GDB is a powerful tool that allows one to debug complex problems like hanging processes, so going to native code, or like debugging processes or post-mortem after the crash. And uh, I hope that now you at least know there is such an option, and maybe it will help you in the future. And uh, on modern distros, if you use Ubuntu or Debian in production, or CentOS, RHEL, it must be as simple as installing of GDB and installing the C Python, uh, the debugging symbols for CPython. So you, you can even do it in the production system if you, well, you can at least take a core down in the production system and then analyze it later. But there are a few known gotchas. Hopefully some of them in virtual environments are not that severe anymore. But if you know if you know about them, if you like know the internals of the process, it must not be a problem for you. Thanks everyone, that's all I wanted to share. Questions? Yes. Let's maybe use mic so that it gets important. Okay, I have two questions about uh, uh, threads, right? So you said when you attach to the process, all threads are stopped, right? Is it the same uh, when you actually hit a breakpoint, or...? Yeah, it's the same. So, all, all the threads are stopped when you hit the breakpoint on one of them, right? It is done on purpose, so that, uh, so that when, when you hit the breakpoint, when you start to... Use yeah, it's done on purpose, so that when you actually attach the process, so hit the breakpoint, right? When you start introspecting the state, so that it does not change while you introspect. So it's done on purpose. I'm not sure if you can like specifically run one thread or not. I haven't haven't tried that. Uh, so the other question, for example, you have a function running in two threads. I mean, two threads are executing the same function, and you have a breakpoint within this function, right? And it's hitting one of these threads, right? How like will it be, how to say, stopped? In 
both threads or in the first thread or because for example like in PyCharm if you have a function that is like executed by two threads and it's hit the first thread, the other thread is not like it's not it doesn't stop right when it reaches the line. So do you know how it works in GPT? Uh, so I can't tell you for sure, but my perception was that uh, if you like do PS EF on Linux system, right? You will actually go H top, top, whatever. You will actually see that each thread has its own process ID. So what you can do, you can attach in GDB. You can pass the process ID not of the top process, right? You can pass the process ID of a specific thread because on Linux, threads are just a specific case of processes, uh, vice versa. But my point is, when I try to attach to a specific thread. It like GDB will only show me this thread as if it was the only thread in the application. And when I attach to my original process, I could see every thread. So back to your question. I think if, if you try to debug the top process, when you, if you set a breakpoint in some function and it is hit, it may be hit from different threads, right? The first one that hits it suspends execution of other threads. Uh, and uh, my perception, but I haven't read it. If you try to do the very same thing, but attach not to top process, but to a specific thread, I think you, you, will, you it will only stop the, this way thread. Great top things. Uh, and you mentioned a case where you had to use this to solve a problem in your code, or yeah. Yeah. So I think the top problems for us. Uh, as I mentioned, we use eventlet for calculating concurrency and use it for both PC applications and system diamonds we have. So we often have the problem with, uh, we, we also, in our reference architecture, we use a thing called Ceph. I'm not sure if anyone heard about Ceph storage. So basically there is a library, librpd, which is a native library. And the, the problem with it is that it may stuck in uh, very unnatural cases, like let's say you lost connectivity to your they call set monitor processes. It's like the proxies you connect to before connecting to storage. And uh, what we saw that at some point our processes just hang, and we couldn't really understand why. And this technique was very useful to debug that. And uh, as I mentioned, there is a link to the problem with mod wizzy. I'm not sure if it, if it's solved by now, but. The problem we saw that when we configured ModWizzy to serve our application, and uh, I think before the first request is served, we triggered the reload or something like that, the Apache crash. And uh, that was the, how we debugged it. Yeah, so I think that's that's the most common thing. Do you think then uh, is to eventually replace the GDB with GDB or just to keep the, uh, them uh, separate and do the best thing uh, for each? Yeah, I think it's the latter because, as we saw, right, not everything is possible with GDB. Like, like I said, in PDB you could, for example, print an arbitrary Python expression, not just value of local variable. You can, like, local variable plus something or whatever, whatever. And uh, so I think GDB is, like, very useful for specific cases, like handy processes, going to native code, like post-mortem divide. But overall, I think you should, you should start with simple things like PDB or uh, actually, things like RPDB, which is basically just a wrapper around PDB to allow attaching from remotely, right? We have CP socket or things like PyDev D are even more sophisticated in the sense that they can even attach to a process. So you should start with them, and only when you only when you need to like debug any processes or native code, then you should go to GDB. So it's a specific tool for each use for its own use cases, but overall you should start with a simple one that you're used to. That's, that's my advice. Any more questions? Um, is it possible to set such a breakpoint in GDB that will be triggered when uh, the interpreter <coughs> executes a specific line so I can set a breakpoint that will uh, stop when the interpreter is in a specific file and in a specific line? Uh, I think it is, but it's not like it's built in. So, as I said, you have to become a bit creative, like 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 with the yeah, like with the yeah like with the breakpoint in main directory. So basically, what you need to do, you would need to this uh, this function we saw by Wolfram X 
Uh, its first argument is a reference to a Python frame. In this frame, you can look, it's a C structure, right? And you can take a look uh, at the fields it has, and one of the fields is like F line number or whatever. So what you could do, you could write a condition in GDB, like in C expression, right? C expression that would uh, trigger a specific line. So you kind of have, you kind of able to do that, but it's not, it's not just straightforward. <laughs> Hey, thanks everyone.